Welcome to the Fintech Scaling Show. This podcast is sponsored by ScaleUp Consulting, helping fintech startups accelerate customer acquisition and set up business operations to scale systematically. When you're ready to grow, reach out to us at richard at scaleupconsulting.co. Now, over to the show with Richard Doty, founder and host. Hello, everyone. Today on the show, we have Julian Dixon, CEO of Napier, out here in London. Hey, Julian, how's it going? Good to have you on the show today. Thank you, Richard. Good morning to you. Yeah, great. Thank you for inviting me. Cool. Let's kick things off. Maybe we can start by you telling us a bit about yourself and also the business that you're in. Sure. My background's in banking. I worked in both domestic banking and wholesale and investment banking. I worked in London, Tokyo and New York. In 2008, I left the banking industry and became more entrepreneurial and got invested in various fintechs. And then in 2015, I set up Napier. And that was my first foray into setting up a company on my own. And I did that in the anti-money laundering space. And what we do is we provide financial crime software to financial institutions broadly, and also act the wider industry. So financial crime, sanction checking type software. Cool. And maybe we can take a couple of steps back. Obviously, I've watched from the sidelines a bit, as I've seen you grow and also Napier grow over the last sort of five odd years. It would be good to understand how your journey has evolved over those five years and maybe sort of specifically looking at how you started and how it's moved on and how you got to where you are today. Sure. I fortuitously fell into setting up Napier as a result of doing some work on a consultancy basis. And I saw an opportunity really as early as 2013, 2014. It was obvious at that time that the industry was going through a change really forced upon it by the regulators. And there were a lot of fines occurring. And the financial industry wasn't really ready for it. They weren't equipped for it. And you saw this barrage of fines coming from the regulator. And the answer from the financial institutions was to hire people. That provides a short-term fix for sure. It's a very expensive fix and it's short-term. And it doesn't really get you out of the initial problem, which was inadequate software, poor controls, policies that aren't fit for purpose, And I think it was a bit of a wake-up call for the industry in general. And we built some software that, albeit we built it rather quickly, was outperforming the legacy software that was there. So the idea of setting up a company to provide this software germinated from that point. And we did that. I mean, the five years since then has been a journey of ups and downs, as everybody's journey is, I guess. And what we found was, was that albeit... The industry is crying out for new tech. It's not necessarily an individual level ready for it because every company that requires mandated software by the regulator already has something in place. And if it's not performing adequately, that, as we talked about, was supplemented very often by people and the actual appetite to change that within the financial services industry is quite a slow and onerous one because they have their own procedures to go through budgetary cycles and there's a reticence for them to change even legacy technology because frankly it's very difficult for them to do that and that's very understandable so what we found was that there were two big opportunities for us one was providing software as a service managed software that could be very easily distributed to the clients and secondly for those larger clients that have got big implementations was supplementing their software. So they have legacy implementations, maybe a bit inefficient, but we can add our new tech, our new products in it, and it can supplement it and thus reduce the need for them to spend onerous amounts of time doing fairly labor-intensive drudgery work and use their intellect and their cool people to actually look more intensely at the real cases. 
Okay, and just staying on that for a sec, I mean, you mentioned that you developed the tech pretty rapidly. So my assumption is, and I think you alluded to it anyway in your answer, that the adoption and the acceptance of the business wasn't sort of straight off the bat. As a pioneering or a, an early adopter, an early creator of this type of technology, what are the steps that you have to go through in order to get that client engagement and client adoption also I guess, maybe also get your first win in a way. Sure. I think you've got to have some pretty cool USPs that you can show to the clients and a clear path to an advantageous situation for them. But perhaps more than that, you need to have brand and reputation recognition. That, frankly, is doing the hard yards in the market. It's time. You need to be around for a reasonable amount of time building your brand and your reputation to gain the trust of those institutions. This is, after all, compliant software, and compliant software is a regulatory mandated piece of software, and they want to be sure that, firstly, that you're reputable, that you've got tenure, and you're going to be there for them in the following years. Yeah, that's what they all look for. And I guess for some of our listeners, they've logged on listening to you, and might not be specifically in financial services or in this space. Can you explain the problem that you guys are actually trying to solve? Sure. So every financial institution has got a regulatory requirement to ensure that it is looking for and investigating financial crime within its organization. And that can be anything from fraud to people or companies on sanctions lists, whether they be European, US or UN sanctions lists, and also people infiltrating dirty money into the system, so money laundering. So what our software does is it helps banks identify money laundering patterns, it helps them identify nefarious parties that are on lists, and it does that in a couple of ways which are fairly unique in the industry. Firstly, I mean, everyone will talk about the reduction of false positives, and that is because when you look for bad actors or patterns, you have to cast the net fairly wide, and therefore you catch a lot of things that are perfectly innocent. And our software helps you reduce that net and therefore only focus on transactions or people that are more likely to be nefarious. And secondly, we use a lot of automation in the product. And I think that's what the advantage of having very modern technology gives you. It allows you to build the latest techniques into it. We can talk about scale. So we're talking about big data architecture. So it can go from zero to infinity pretty quickly in a cheaper way than has previously been allowed to. Then the other aspect of that is the artificial intelligence and machine learning, which is really part of the DNA of our product and was deliberately built and set up so that it could be extendable. And that's advantageous over legacy providers because they have to bolt it onto the side, whereas we have it as an integrated and very directional piece of technology within our platform. In simple terms, you provide information to businesses which allows them to track and understand what's going on from a money laundering perspective. Yes. Yeah. And then obviously that gives them the information to either perform an action, i.e. raise the alarm bell or just monitor it over a period of time. That's exactly right. So they have a fiduciary responsibility to perform these tasks on a daily basis and a more long-term basis. And should they find patterns or evidence of patterns or infractions within their data, they have a responsibility to report that to the appropriate regulatory authority. And those authorities are obviously different depending on your location, because everyone has national authorities in which they have to report to and regimes which they work within. To bring this to life, could you provide a maybe a simple use case? a live use case or one that you guys have worked with over the last few years as to how your tech actually helped a business perform these tasks? Sure, I'll give you a couple of examples. So I'll give you one in screening 
of names. So there are lists called sanctions lists that exist that are published by various regulatory bodies. So you've got the OFAC list, which is a US-based body. You've got a European list. You've got a UN-based list, and there's various other lists. And also banks themselves will have their own internal lists. And what they're looking for are on those lists names of people, names of companies, names of shipping vessels, or other entities that for some reason you are not allowed to trade with. And if you do trade with them, the fines can be punitive and it also gives you reputational damage. Now, the problem is, of course, is using that technology we've probably all heard of, which is fuzzy logic, but perhaps don't necessarily know what it does. So if you're looking for a name like Richard Doherty, if you happen to be in that list, are you looking for Richard Doherty? How do you spell Richard? Do you use a nickname, Dickie? Is it R. Doherty? Is it Mr. R. Doherty? So there's lots of different ways in which your name can be put within a list. And there's lots of different names of which any transaction can have your name. So fuzzy logic is something that looks at all of that, understands it, and will come back with potential hits, bearing in mind all of those different ways in which the names can be used and written. We've got a use case where, and this is an age-old problem, by the way, it's quite a complex problem to solve. And we work with a company that had a big problem. They were getting 8% false positives on a fairly large data set, more than 10 million transactions. So 8% false positives is 800,000 records. 800,000 records is a substantive amount for a human being to look at. Most of those will be false positives, depending how wide you've cast that net. But nonetheless, you still have to go through a process and you have to be able to evidence that process should a regulator or your internal audit ever come to look to show that you have done it correctly. So with that particular company, they had their 8% alerts thrown out. We built an API. We put it into our system using our advanced technology And we reduced that 8% by 93%. And that 93%, so that meant that they had a team of people that could cope with the amount of work that that threw out. So previously, 800,000 names, they couldn't cope with it. After that, whatever 93% of 800,000 is, was a number that they could actually deal with in the team without putting stress on that team and therefore do that work correctly and appropriately and document it properly. And that, by the way, was all done with exactly the same policy and procedure. So there was no corner cutting with that. That was just the straight use of our technology. The other place that we help people is in looking for spurious transactions. So, and we're talking about movements of money or people trading. If you're trading different types of asset classes, I mean, everyone's heard of, well, perhaps not everyone, but there's lots of cases of money being moved illicitly across border through different trading patterns. There was the laundromat, a very famous case. And also money has to be put into the system by criminals in order to turn it to be clean. And they're very sophisticated at doing this. So it's looking at patterns of behaviors and breaches. So typically you would look at transactions that breach a certain size transactions that are anomalous or different for usual so you're looking for behavioral changes the simple more legacy software just looks at very simple things like is it between two different countries and if it breaches a certain size you need to look at it whereas more advanced technology like ours can start to break down the patterns of behavior of that individual account and compare it to its own history it can compare it to its peers in the industry. So if you're an individual, it can compare it to other individuals and it can compare it on a global scale. So we combine all of those pattern behaviors and we are able to identify anomalous transactions that should be looked at in more detail. Yeah, some great examples there. Thanks for that. And as we sort of roll forward and obviously we're in the middle of a worldwide pandemic, what has, if any, what has been the impact on your business through this pandemic and also maybe on the sort of fin crime and money laundering space? So, I mean, I think 
there's been a lot of articles written about COVID-19 and the effect on money laundering. And actually, if you go to our website, we've done quite a few blogs on it. But I would point out a fairly basic thing that I think everyone can understand is if as a criminal, it's your job to put cash that you've gained illicitly into the banking system, you would normally do this through what would appear to be legitimate businesses. Now, what we've seen in COVID-19 is that a lot of these businesses have not been able to operate and trade. So therefore, the criminals, in my opinion, must be gathering cash somewhere and their ability to put it in in the ways they've done up to the period of COVID-19 are somewhat limited. So they will be finding new ways to infiltrate the system, which we all need to be aware of. And COVID-19 on our business in Napier, we're extremely fortunate that we work in a fintech business and we're also a company that has flexible working policy anyway. So everybody within the Napier company, Napierians as we call ourselves, are able to work from home with relative ease. So on that basis, it hasn't impacted our daily lives. And what we've seen is we've seen that business globally is continually there, but the sales cycles for us have got a bit slower, mainly because people are obviously reorganizing themselves and their decision-making processes are a little bit slower. That being said, post-COVID-19, and Lord help us all that that happens soon and we can go back to normality, we would expect to see a change in the market. When everyone comes back to work and everyone discusses the problems they've had in large organizations working remotely, we believe that there will be a mandate or it will be mandated in institutions that they need to start to change the technology to enable more flexible working. That plays into the hands of everybody who's got new and modern technology that is flexible, adaptable, extensible, because new technology providers are able to give technology that can be distributed globally, accessed globally, work collegiately globally, and it really does help people, we believe, in the post-COVID world. You mentioned there that over the past few months, COVID has come to the forefront of business and also obviously our minds. You mentioned that there's been a slight slowdown in the sales cycle, other than closing existing pipeline and what have you. What else have you guys been doing? Is it a time to develop deeper relationships with partners and others? Is it a time to maybe look at that horizon that you just mentioned post-COVID and really stretch the strategic vision out and stop that planning process? What have you guys been doing over the last that's three, a, three or four That's a really, it's an interesting question. I mean, I wonder whether the listeners have got similar experiences to me and Napier. Everybody in Napier is working, I think, even harder than they were working previously. The fact that you don't have to attend an office allows you to have a full day concentrating on work and everyone is at the grindstone every day and working I think even harder than they were before, which is all credit to them. And I'm very proud of the team for doing that. Within this period, we have not slowed down. We are very, very busy. We made an acquisition of some assets from Refinitiv. So Refinitiv had two products within the same space as us. One is called Screening Deployed and one is called Transwatch. And we acquired those during lockdown. And we are now communicating with all of those clients We are offering them extended support because previously that was in some doubt. So they are comfortable on their platform that they have today. And we're also offering them an upgrade path to our super cool new technology. So we've been really busy doing that. On organic growth, it's been about still talking to all of the clients in the market. I think a lot of people, a lot of our potential clients are in a similar situation. They're at home. Their working days are extended because they have no traveling or office distractions. And I think a lot of projects, certainly around discovery of technology for when they go back, are being undertaken. So we're having lots and lots of conversations with people. We're able to do demos through the amazing technology we've got, Zoom, Teams, whatever. And I think there's a general acceptance globally that the way that we communicate, doing conversations and demonstrations, 
I think it's legitimized it more. So previously, we might have had to have got on an aeroplane and flown to the US or flown to Asia to have a face-to-face meeting. And I think COVID-19 somewhat, perhaps accidentally, has legitimized communication using all this amazing technology we've got. So we are giving multiple demos every day. We're talking to our clients all the time. And I guess in some ways, we know they're at home. So they're easier to get hold of. I think often people are working somewhat isolated. So they enjoy the conversation. They enjoy looking at the technology and they enjoy that perhaps that little break in their day to see something new, something innovative and something really cool. Congrats on the acquisition. I know you've mentioned that to me in private. That's awesome. Awesome stuff. It's also good to hear that people are closing deals and moving business forward during the lockdown. Off the back of the acquisition, where are you guys now? I mean, obviously you're based in London. You're doing some workouts in the US at some point. Well, are you now global? We have a global footprint of clients. We've got clients in US, Europe, Pan-Asia, Australia, New Zealand. So it's pretty global footprint. We've got offices in London, Singapore. Our engineering team is based in Kiev. And it's our intention to open up an office and get a presence in the US just as soon as we can. I guess that's somewhat delayed through COVID. So post-COVID, that'll be on our radar. So we're truly becoming a global company supporting and supplying to our global audience. And it's very exciting times for us. And outside of that, I mean, you have alluded to some of the opportunities that you foresee, but what else can you mention about opportunities right now for your business and also maybe stepping or putting your neck out and say industry-wide going forward, what are the big blocks and the big opportunities that you guys are looking at right now? I think that industry-wide There's still a conversation around whether you need this kind of software on premise or whether you can use the cloud, a managed service. And that is both an institutional conversation and it's also a regulatory conversation. So that is constantly going on. Some institutions are more advanced in their thinking and some regulators are more advanced in our thinking. And we as a company have to adapt and be able to supply all of those under that regime. And as such, we have the ability to deploy our technology via cloud as a managed service or via cloud onto a private cloud for our clients, or we can do it on-prem as well. So we're constantly grappling with that problem. That gives us a very broad base to support, but we're very good at it. And going forward, I think the industry is really at a place where It needs to up its game, as we said in the very beginning. That's being forced upon it by the regulatory regime within Europe. We've just had the fifth anti-money laundering directive, and that's closely followed up by the sixth, which is, I think, coming out mid-next year. Each time those directives come out, the bar is raised. And no doubt the sixth will be followed by the seventh and the eighth. So the bar is raised every time. And The US also has a fairly stringent regulatory regime. And globally, these regimes are increasingly difficult to adapt to. And the only way you can adapt to these regimes is by having modern, extensible, adaptable technology. So the cost of ownership of legacy technology, it will get to a tipping point at some stage, and it will be different in different places for different organizations where it just becomes too hard for them to satisfy the regulatory regime with the budgets they have. And at that point, they will, or hopefully before that point, they will be looking at adapting the technology they've got, adding more modern technology to it, or indeed changing their platform. So we would see that as the first steps. And then the whole question around AI, Richard, is a really interesting one. We talked about how our platform that was built within the DNA. And AI is a trend within the anti-money laundering fin crime industry, but it's also a trend in industry in a broader sense. And it's quite a complex subject. You need to have a certain level of understanding just to really grasp the basic principles of it. But the reality is, is that AI is still in its infancy and is still being developed. And it is not the panacea to solve all the problems within the anti-money laundering industry. And what we see is is that a lot of companies we have 
need to get the basics done first and we would encourage them to do the basics very well and our software allows you to do the basics very very well and get a grip of your daily processes have procedures in that are robust and are evidence to the regulatory authorities that you have a grasp and you are in control of what's going on and once you have that regime in place you can then start to add artificial intelligence and machine learning technologies to up the game even further and drive efficiencies within that process because ai is all about greater insight more efficiency but until you're as an organization and i'm talking particularly about anti money laundering until your platform is doing the basic things right it is a little bit futile to layer on ai because it won't help you you need to do the basic things right and then you can add on ai i hear you so i mean you mentioned i guess your clients getting the basics right but what is the challenge around that it's one thing you and i having a chat and saying guys get the basics right but how can businesses actually get these things right so the next layer the ai layer can come in maybe a bit quicker than we all envisage that is a great question and in no way do i think that people go out and are doing something that they shouldn't be doing but I think through circumstances and it depends on the maturity of the organization so with large organizations they are somewhat hindered by the fact that they've got huge globally spread systems and vast amounts of data and that is one challenge and if you're in a smaller organization you have the challenge around budgets and getting expertise large organizations are able to get in huge amounts of expertise to help them smaller organizations often we talk to very small organization where the money laundering reporting officer isn't a full time job they do other things in that organization as well and that and so it's fully understandable but what we would say is that when you look to improve what you have the place you need to look first is your policy and procedure your policy and procedure should reflect your company's appetite for risk and its appetite for how it looks at compliance and that should be reflected within the regulatory regime you're in and once you have your policy and procedure fully mature or understandable your system should reflect that policy and procedure all too often we hear about systems being put in that in no way reflect the policy and procedure of the company and thus results are coming out and people don't understand why those results are coming out so if in a system that is put behind and reflects policy and procedure you should be able to go in look at any individual incident and it should reflect through as to why that incident has been raised what is the procedure that's got you there and what is the policy behind that and if you are able to do that you are able to show yourself in complete control of both your data your processes your policy and as an audit point that makes you very strong and then when you can do that you can then start to really really look at the infractions and the illegal monies and the fraud the money laundering that is going on with some vigor because you're covered on all of the basics and then with some vigor you can actually start to attack the main problem i think at the moment organizations are often overwhelmed by data false positives and just getting through the day having looked at all of those things and i think what modern technology can do is remove a lot of that noise and let you focus on the real problems cool and i mean i think that's some sage advice and as you guys are in apm move forward over the next 6 to 12 months obviously you've mentioned you got global ambitions you're a global company right now you may at some point in the next few months be opening up an office in the US what are your actual growth plans over this period and specifically how you're going to achieve them because as you know we're in the middle of a bit of a crisis so it'll be good to see what your route to market and building your business is yeah so the UK is in an interesting place richard as you know so we seem to be a little bit further behind the world in our ease of lockdown everyone else seems to be a bit more advanced and all credit to those nations i've heard lots of stories around countries like for instance nigeria that are so advanced and they've done so well in this period 
In the UK, we haven't been so lucky and we are still locked down today. But within that time, we have been able to hire people. We have onboarded people. It's just a case of we've never met these people in person. So we've done all of the interviews and the hiring process. And indeed, they've started their work and they are all locked away at their respective homes and are working away. So that has not slowed us down. It may be a slight kink in the road, but we're completely over that. And we were able to adapt to that very quickly indeed. In terms of opening offices in places like the United States, clearly the United States is probably the same situation as the UK, where there still is huge issues with coronavirus, albeit I know states are at different levels there, but we would expect that hopefully in Q4, we are able to start traveling again a little bit more extensively. We will look to open an office then, albeit we can still interview and talk to people and start to engage with the market using Teams and Zoom and and whatever, whatever ways we can do it. For the rest of the world, the rest of the world moves on at a quicker pace we would expect to be traveling more extensively within those regions sooner. I feel that you guys are also doing some business out in Asia, and Asia seems to definitely be sort of ahead of the game with this whole situation. Yeah, absolutely. I think it goes on a country-by-country basis, but Asia, I think it had the pandemic perhaps earlier than us. Also, it had history in it, so it's seen those kinds of diseases come to them before, so they were more able to adapt to it quickly. So yes, they seem to be easing down a little bit quicker than the rest of the world. Before we wrap up, I mean, I think you've had a fascinating journey in getting Napier to where it is now. What is the biggest tip you can give our listeners who are on the cusp of scaling their businesses right now? If you're going from small scale to growing the business, I would say you have to be adaptable. There are growing pains in a business and indeed we face growing pains every day. The bright side of that, of course, is those pains are different, but better than startup pains. So growing pains exist. I would say as a tip, you have to expect them and you have to be adaptable. And if you've taken your business that far, you clearly are a good leader. You've got a strong company and you will be able to adapt and overcome them. So just have the tenacity to keep going and scale your business. If you can get to that point in time, you've done an amazing job. So just keep going. No, awesome. Some great tips there. Julian, listen, thanks for coming on the show. How can people find and connect with you and the Napier team? As you call them, what do you guys call them? Napierians. Napierians, that's it. I don't know. Anyway, yeah. I'm on LinkedIn. We have social media channels. Or you can email me directly at julian.dixon at napier.ia. Hopefully this has resonated with some of your listeners, both in the UK and in South Africa. And feel free to reach out, have a look at our blogs. We've got white papers there. If you're in this industry, there's quite a lot of really cool things to look at there. And just drop me a line. It'd be great to hear from you. Great to hear your thoughts. I think this industry compliance in itself is a fairly serious industry. And one of the things that we're trying to do with the technology we've got is to give the power back to those people. I think they felt in a lot of cases fairly powerless. Um, It's to give the power back and to give them some really cool software and make compliance a bit sexy because that's what it should be. It should be a really interesting thing to do. And we are trying to do something that is good for the world here. Money laundering affects every single person on this planet and everything we can do, if we do it collectively, then the effect is greater. And it's something that we should all be trying to do and trying to help. So feel free to reach out to me and ask any questions that you want. Oh, great. I mean, listen, thanks again for coming on, Julian. It's been amazing to listen to you and what you've achieved over the last few years with Napier and also the fact that you, in your own words, are taking the fight to the industry and also the fight to the bad guys out there in a way. And on the fun side of things, making compliance sexy. There we go. We all want a bit of fun in our lives. But listen, thanks for sharing. Loved our chat. And hopefully at some point, maybe we can do this again. Great. Total pleasure, Richard. Thank you very much indeed.